Hey everyone, welcome to The Conversation. This podcast is produced by Capital Community Church, located in Fredericton, New Brunswick. If you happen to be in the area, we would love the chance to connect with you, so you're invited. We invite you to join us on campus for one of our weekly services, and we would be honored to have the chance to meet you. For more information, you can check out our website, capitalcommunity.ca. But now on to today's episode. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Mark Brown while he was in town preaching at our annual Youth Weekend. Mark has served in a myriad of ministry roles over the years in South Dakota, including lead pastor, youth president, Sunday school director, and in this current season, he serves South Dakota as their district superintendent and also a circuit rider, preacher, and church planter, something that he shares a little bit about today. Mark is husband to Jordan. He is father to Noah, Grace, and Eden. He is a phenomenal preacher of the gospel, and perhaps the highest compliment that I could pay to Mark is that just being around him challenges you to be better. During our conversation, we talked about many different things, including having a kingdom over culture mindset, how the church is to respond to past injustices, having a unified ministry approach in a marriage, and much, much more. So thanks once again for tuning in to today's episode. I pray that it's a blessing to you. And without further delay, enjoy the conversation. To everybody joining us today, thank you for being with us on the podcast. Thanks for joining the conversation. And also thanks to Mark Brown for being with us today. He's in Fredericton. He's been preaching our youth weekend. We've been honored to have him in our conference, but certainly honored to have you on the podcast as well. So why don't you go ahead and greet all of our listeners? Well, thank you for letting me be here. I'm excited, and God willing, we have a good time hanging out here. Absolutely. I think we will. You know, this is, um, I think, the third time that we've sat down for an interview, so maybe you feel like this is starting to get like old hat, (laughs) (laughs) And, and really, it's actually kind of like the fourth time, because the first time the recording corrupted and we had to do it a second time. So yeah, this is not new for us. I feel like we're developing a, an interview relationship a little bit. <laughs> but uh, what I want to start off with today, um, certainly if you want to tell us a little bit about your family and what's going on in South Dakota, and then shortly after, if you want to move into kind of a new season of ministry that you guys are stepping into in South Dakota as a family, your basically pioneering a new initiative, not just in the state and in the district that you're in, but really in our fellowship. It's called The Next Town. So if you would unpack that, I guess the the inception of it, where it came from, and what it looks like and how this, you know, I think when it was first presented, it felt like a, uh, a pivotal sort of thing, a, a game changer in many ways. So just talk about your burden for that and this transition <clears throat> season for your family. Yeah, so uh, family's doing good. Uh, wife, three kids, been married 17 years. Noah's going to be 12 this May. Grace is nine. Uh, Eden is six. They're doing fantastic. Um, and we're in transition together. We started a church plant when we were uh, 20 years old, uh, relaunching a, a work in Watertown, South Dakota. And uh, it was a very grueling process. The first six years was the most depressing of my life, really. Um, But the latter half has been progressively greater. And namely, the past two, three years have been so fruitful. And the past year has been amazing. Like, we've just been in revival. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in a service. Chris Green was preaching. And um, he shared a story of... Uh, during the COVID pandemic, he was in Portland, Oregon, and that was pretty intense season during the COVID and it was, the rioting was going on and uh, he caught wind of a revival, a uh, tent revival, outdoor revival that was taking place in Portland, Oregon. And he's like, what? That, that can't be done. It's like, there's riots going on. And it was this charismatic group, but he ended up going to it cause he was very curious and he went and, uh, in the story he's sharing, he went to the revival and just to see if they're able to pull this off. And the rioters were all around, stuff's getting destroyed. And while they're having church service, the riots coming, like 
God put up a shield around this charismatic group, and they had church. There was people getting the Holy Ghost speaking mm-hmm. in tongues. It was he said it was wild. Wow! And the Lord spoke to him and said, "They're doing more with less, and you're doing less with more. Mm-hmm. Meaning they have less truth, and they're making more sacrifice. You have more truth. You're making less sacrifice because he, you know, to his." confession was just saying like he couldn't do certain outreach and things because of the riots and when he said that i mean god spoke to me in that moment it was in may last year and he said you're comfortable you're comfortable uh you're enjoying this revival that's taking place and i i've not called you to watertown i've called you to the land because i never heard god tell me to pastor that may shock some people but i've never heard him tell me to pastor the only thing I've ever heard God tell me to do is South Dakota. Go to South Dakota. And he gave me a burden for the land. But I didn't understand it for years. Not until around year 10 that it started dawning on me that God called me to a land. Mm-hmm. And I started loving the land, getting in covenant with the land, learning about the land. And so anyways, all that to say this, at that moment, I felt it was a culmination and uh, in that service, three different people came up to me and spoke a very clear word uh, of what I was to do. And I was standing in front of the pulpit, and it was like a, almost like a, a movie closing cinematic image where everything turned gray and it was fading. And it was like I, I saw visually a book close, and I felt the wind from the pages close. And God said, Your chapter here is done. Wow. And so, all that to say this, a long story long, is that um, I felt God has called us to basically use a circuit rider concept to go to all these rural towns that do not have churches. In South Dakota, there's about 310 towns, 66 counties, and we have seven works currently in South Dakota, and uh, we got to reach them. Yes. And waiting what I felt the Lord spoke to me is we can't wait for people to come. Then he said, the next pastors in the next town, you got to go to the next town, find people, disciple them. And in that next town is the next pastor who doesn't have to move their family. Doesn't have to get a job. Doesn't have to learn the culture. Doesn't have to adjust. They're already there. They, you just need to give them what they don't have. And that's the truth. The truth. Yeah. So that's our, our initiative uh, right now, and it's um, we're still in process. We're raising PIMs. Uh, we were appointed by NAM as uh, missionaries to South Dakota, and uh, so that's kind of where things are at right now. So, uh, just really quickly, if somebody that's listening would like to support, uh, certainly in prayer, but financially, is there a way that they can do so? Yeah, um, you know, if you went to the North American Missions website, I don't recall it exactly offhand the exact name of the website but if you you know look at upci's website and they have a link to north american missions and then they have a metro missionary link and they will have all of their missionaries that you could support and you can one give online that way yeah or you could reach out to the upci headquarters and ask about you know of course getting a pim form um, we're not metro missionaries obviously we're rural missionaries but it's all under that metro missionary program and we'll try to link to that in the description and whatever below so you can check that out thank you um so one thing that you've said while we've been having conversation this weekend is and you've already referenced how in watertown it was slow and arduous for six or seven years nobody receiving the holy ghost in any of the services that you were having until finally had a breakthrough and then the latter half has been more fruitful. But one thing you said is that you felt God speak to you and say that what you're doing now would not be that way, that God was going to do a quick work. Yes, sir. And so maybe comment on that. And also I, you, you've shared a little bit of a, uh, well, a, a testimony of how God is, is really fulfilling that it's going to be a quick work. So I'll let you speak. Yeah. So it was overwhelming because I felt God tell us to start three works right off the bat and that it was going to to multiply. It was going to grow fast. And I cannot keep up with the vision that he's given my wife and I. We, he's speaking to both of us very clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could start talking about some of those things, and it would sound like I'm insane, to be honest with you. Um, but the vision has to be bigger than your reach, because if you could reach it and make it happen, then you don't need God. Right. So everything he's given my wife and I, 
we recognize without him we can do none of this um so but it's it's messing with my head because it's taken so long to get where we are at and um so when he's given these big ideas i'm just like man god i believe it but really it's going to be that quick and I believe God just this week gave us another confirming sign. There's multiple signs I could share, but here's one big one just this week. This past Monday, um, we went to one of the towns that we've been doing prayer walks, prayer drives in, and the Lord spoke to us to go to this town. And um, we got a meeting room location at a visitor center. And so we went there to sign the agreement, all that stuff. And as we're doing that, the lady begins to inquire who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it. And I shared with her that we're doing these prayer drives throughout small rural towns in South Dakota. We felt the Lord speak to us to do this work here. And she got emotional. She got moved by it. And she said, well, I, I need to connect you to some people in this community. I, I got to connect you to some people. Let's, let's, I'll, I'll do what I can. Give me your number. Here's my number, et cetera. She gave me her card and then after that, she later stated, if there's anything I can do, anything you need to know about our town, just let me know and I'm, I'm going to take care of you. And I said, well, if you, you happen to know of any vacant buildings, you know, they're just, just been sitting, you know, we'll be interested to look at them. Yeah. And not that we have anything for them, but I just made that statement. And she says, well, you know, there is this, this, this one church. Let me, let me get this person's contact information. And she was so kind and uh, gave us this information. And I called that guy right away and I talked to him and he reached out to someone to open up this church to go let us look into it. It's a congregational church, 138 year old building. We're touring through it. And after it's all done, I call that gentleman back and uh, tell him, man, this is awesome. This is a great place. And he told me, he goes, well, if you want it, it's yours. I'll give you the title, the deed. You guys can own the property, Amazing. everything. All Amazing. you need to do is meet with your board, have them write a letter of intent, and uh, that's where we're at right now. We uh, wrote a letter of intent. I mail it to them when I get back to the states. <laughs> yep. And um, so, I we're in the process of receiving a free church building and a free church property under Amazing. our name, and we haven't even taught a Bible study in that town yet. That's that's a quick work, you know? Yeah, yeah. So excited about that. Absolutely. Believe more is to come. And, uh, you know, I kind of <clears throat> alluded to this, but, you know, this really feels like the tip of the spear for revival across America, across North America, and just the model of reaching into the the rural communities of our of our provinces, our states. Um, so thank you for being on that on the tip of that spear and, and really pioneering it in many ways. Um, you mentioned... Um, you know, you were called to South Dakota. You were called to the land. I believe it was T.F. Tenney. Uh, maybe at a bot years ago, preach, you know, uh, make a covenant with the land. Yeah. Something to that effect. So, um, again, in conversation over the past few days, you talked about reading through the, the Bible one year several times, and every time God would, like, uh, identify a different thread or maybe a different focus as you would read. And one time it was a focus on the land itself, and I uh, wonder if you would share a little bit of what you shared um, just the other day in conversation. Yeah, this was, um, I can't remember if it was 2020 or 21. I felt challenged to read through the Bible every month. Uh, I have a friend who his father has been doing that for over 30 years, reads through the Bible every single month. Wow. And so, you know, every year I try to reevaluate personal devotion and, and try things differently so I don't get stuck in a rut. So I tried it. It seemed an overwhelming task, and I didn't know what I was going to get out of it um, because it's a lot of reading, yeah. uh, almost three hours a day. Wow. Um, and I broke it up throughout the day. But what I noticed, there was a pattern every time I did it where I would see a thread mm -hmm. woven through the tapestry of 66 books, and it was a theme or an anthem echoing, reverberating throughout all of them. And uh, so I would take notes through everything. I, I have... I just took notes. And so one of the months, the Lord showed me this thread of heal the land. And it stood out to me. And I mean, I could I could spend a long time. And if anyone ever wants to listen to it, uh, uh, the sermon, it's on our uh, gschurchsd.org's website, heal the land. But anyways, God showed me 
about having to 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 minister in that land effectively you got to heal that land and i begin to see all throughout scripture time and time again where the prophets of old would have to address past atrocities that they weren't even there for mm. and um when that happened god began to speak to me very clearly about the atrocities that happened in South Dakota, uh, large Native American uh, reservations, um, uh, population, and that basically the Lord was challenging me to pray about the past atrocities of the land. And hang on, I wasn't there for it, yeah. but God began to show me scripturally that time and time again, there was the land would be polluted, the land would be defiled, a curse would be on the land, all of this. And God was looking for someone to take care of that issue. And one of the key, there's a number of key verses, but one of them is Deuteronomy 21, that there would be a dead body. There's a law written about a dead body in the middle of the land, and nobody was there nobody saw it happen there no witnesses nobody knew what happened and so they would measure the distance from the dead body to the cities and whatever city it was nearest to that city was commanded to take responsibility and to bring a sin offering for that and pray about it to heal the land wow and so uh the culture i've heard this over and over again growing up uh, even in my own home, and I, I love my mom and dad, and I'm not saying they're prejudiced or racist or anything like that. Um, but the statement is like, you know, well, we never had a slave. Well, we, we, I, I didn't kill nobody. You know, I, I, I'm not racist. Things like that, and you know, they need to get over it. They need to move on. You know, we're we're in the 21st century, but that's not the biblical model. Mm. The biblical model is not to tell people to get over it. The biblical model is God's looking for someone to grieve over it because we live in time. We'll, we 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 move on. Yeah. But God is outside of time. God doesn't move on. An example is King David. He 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 just noticed like man, this drought's been going on a long time. This famine's been going on a long time. This this something's off here. And so he prayed about the land, and God said, "Yes, because a covenant was broken, and the covenant." Saul broke with the Gibeonites. Mm. It wasn't under David's rule. Yep. David wasn't there, but Saul broke a covenant. Well, what covenant was that? That was from hundred years, hundreds of years ago, the covenant with the Gibeonites and Joshua. Mm -hmm. Joshua made a covenant with the people of the land that he wasn't even supposed to. Yeah. But because he made a covenant in the name of God, God made sure that that was established. And when the Israelites broke that covenant, namely Saul, all of a sudden God's like, all right, I, I, my name's on this. And so I'm going to be a man of my word. You know, I'm going to be a God of my word. And so God put a famine on the land, a curse on the land. And David had to find out how to resolve the issue. And he went to the people. He went to the rulers. He asked them, what do we do? And he made a sacrifice to make there be a healing. Now, there's multiple stories like that sure. throughout the Bible. That's just one example. And so it really messed with my my way of thinking, my culture. And uh, when I preach at the church, you could hear a pin drop, man. But I went through scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture about grieving over land. Because here's the deal. Dead men can't repent. Mm. Only the living can repent. And so we can't undo the past. But currently, we can do something about the past by being alive and praying over it. And the ultimate supreme example is Jesus Christ. Because this whole this whole deal is like, well, I didn't do it. You know, I, there's nothing I could do about it. I don't, I'm not racist. I don't have a slave. I didn't kill any natives. I didn't do anything like that. Jesus, the Bible says, he who knew no sin yeah. became sin. Mm. Jesus wasn't the one who sinned. Of course, right. Jesus isn't the one who messed up. We messed up. But what did he do? He came into covenant with us, and he took he addressed the issue. And his blood is different than any other blood. You know the uh, what we do today. You know the the blood of man cries vengeance. The blood of man cries political reparations. Things like that. Government cannot take care of this. Yeah. Only Jesus's blood can take care of it. And the blood of Abel cries revenge, but the blood of Jesus speaks better things. And so in our service, this will be controversial for people, I'm sure. 
I was like, we are going to repent for the sins of the land. And like, you know, it was quiet. <laughs> and people came forward and we started repenting for the sins of the land. Because in South Dakota, at least, many atrocities were done in the name of Jesus. Now, it wasn't one is apostolic, UPCI, whatever. It, it was Catholics and other uh, Lutherans and stuff like that that did some horrible things to the natives. Same same in Canada. I yeah. mean, the, the Catholic Church in various parts of Canada, um, uh, boarding schools and, and things of this yeah, nature. Same thing. Hor- horrible atrocities. And so uh, I, was like, I was like, we're going to repent because the name of Jesus was, was marred. And we begin to grieve over it. And it was, I'm telling it was awkward. But all of a sudden, the winds of heaven, whoosh, the presence of God swept, and there was a healing that took place. Mm-hmm. And then we, there, there is an open heaven over Watertown right now. There is an open heaven over land, and healing was made in the land. And we have been affected. We're a very multicultural church, a diverse church. We have natives in our church. It's, it's a powerful thing. But... It's get over it's not the answer. So on a personal level, that was as a church, but sometimes I think you're right. People, I mean, some people point to politics, reparations, things of this nature. Some people think that um, different types of affirmative action, that, that these these are solutions for these issues. On a personal level, is it just, um, I don't know, actually changing our mentality toward it a little bit? Uh, like that, even you talking about it, uh, yeah, I've said the same sort of things or felt the same th- sort of things. Like, yes, what happened in the past was horrible, but how do we, what do we do now? Mm-hmm. What do I do as an individual? Is it just, is it just being more sensitive to the felt, um, the feelings of those groups? And I don't know, on a personal level, what can somebody do to change uh, that? So uh, one, you want to study your land, wherever you live, study your land, study your geography and find Find the atrocities, find the wrongs that were done, and don't do it from your bias and your perspective. Do it from those people's perspective. And I'm telling you, when I started doing that, it, it was shocking mm. the stories I read from native perspective. It, 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 you can't read it and not weep and cringe. It's, I, I got a book that has uh, every day of the year has the history of every recorded Native American atrocity in the United States of America going back to like the 1600s to the 1980 or 1990s. But every day has on that day multiple events that happen that day with atrocities. And it will blow your mind every day of the calendar year something horrible happened in our country. And so to deal with it, one, learn about it. Learn about it. Because you, you can't fake it. you got to be touched with the feelings of their infirmities like Jesus was. Yeah. He was moved with compassion. And so you can't be some cold, callous, legislative thing. And that's the problem. We try to legislate stuff. You have to get a personal burden. by ex- Exposure breeds a burden is what my pastor teaches. And when I exposed myself, I got a burden, and I sincerely repented. I sincerely began to study and learn. And I'm telling you, I feel very differently about my land. I love my land. I have a passion for the land. And it's created a, a dialogue between myself and natives, our church and natives. And I, because initially, here's how I approach it. I, I approach it and I cast down every native spirit, every native tradition, witchcraft, which there's a spiritual element mm-hmm. absolutely to their, their religion. Absolutely. But that did not heal and that did not fix and create positive relations. Because I preach it and had natives leave the church. It alienated. It absolutely yeah. Yeah. did. But this approach, when we begin to, to, to see it from that perspective and their perspective and biblical perspective, all of a sudden it endeared and it brought healing and mm-hmm. it brought redemption and re- reconciliation. It was, it was powerful for powerful. our church, man. Well, man, thank you for talking about that. That is, it's uh, obviously there's a lot of tensions in our world today. And so I think that sheds kingdom light on modern issues for sure, Uh, which kind of segues into maybe the next topic of conversation. Um, Something you've repeated, uh, just being in your presence a a few times, you've talked a little bit about kingdom over culture. Yeah. And this this pertains to so many different areas, some areas... (laughs) you know, where angels may fear to trot a little bit, they can be sensitive and touchy. Um, you know, 
even you coming here this weekend, there's there's so many hoops and red tape and and stuff you got to go through to cross borders and all that. And and mm-hmm. I appreciate your your spirit about it because because your your mentality toward all of those things was, well, this is for kingdom work. So it's it's my reasonable service that I think you even said that. So uh, it, it can maybe be a, a touchy thing or perhaps controversial to some, but but talk about how not every time that we have a culture from our, I'm in Canada, you're in America, we have culture, but we always have to make sure that kingdom culture supersedes our national culture. Comment on that. Yeah. Um, a little backdrop maybe for some, um, you know, we were namely talking about the, the pandemic, about COVID-19, about vaccination. Because to get here, I had to get vaccinated. To get here, I had to take tests, COVID-19 uh, tests, and I'll have to do so to get back We're going to well. do that after this interview. After that's, this interview. That's, a, that's what we're doing next. So uh, that is a touchy subject. And what's, I, I, I don't, what's somewhat unique is this, is I'm, I live in South Dakota. And what listeners may not know is South Dakota is the only place on planet Earth, definitely in North America, that has never had restrictions, never had mandates, never had shutdown. We got to continue life as normal. Anybody, our governor said it is beyond her constitutional right to govern the people that way to mandate them to wear masks. So some would, you know, beat their chest and be like, that's right, you know, we, we don't wear masks <laughs> in South Dakota, in which I'm Personally, I am thankful. Of course, yeah, I sure. have not had to wear a mask at all. I wish it were that we, way here. We didn't have to get vaccinated. I never got vaccinated over the two years. I never wore a mask in church. I never uh, took a COVID test. And I got COVID. I never got tested. But I mean, I lost my smell. I lost my taste. It doesn't take rocket science to figure that out. And yeah. it's not been the same since. And so... And, that's controversial me saying that because some people say, well, bless God, you're supposed to get vaccinated, you irresponsible, da, da, da. Fine, you know, to each their own. I didn't go around beating my chest and beating social media with vaccine status and argument pro or against. I lived life in my lane and I did it according to prayer and seeking the Lord. And not everybody, it's the same. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was famines in the land. They all went through a famine and one God told to go to Egypt. The other, God says, don't go to Egypt. Mm. God's not bipolar, schizophrenic, whatever. You know, it's just like the, the rule doesn't apply the same to everybody. Yeah, sure. You got to be led by God. If God told me to get vaccinated in South Dakota and only live stream for two years, then that's what we would do. But I'm not doing what everyone else is doing. I'm doing what the Spirit says to do because yeah. it's about the kingdom. Anyways, so the unique thing is I haven't had to do anything that you all have had to do. You asked for me to come out here, and I told you, I'll pray about it. Yeah. And so I, I didn't say anything about vaccination. I didn't say anything, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm American. I'm South Dakotan. I pray about it. And the Lord put on my heart, I'm, I'm going to come to Canada. And, you know, people from South Dakota are like, oh, you're going to get vaccinated? Well, yeah, because that's what I need to do to go to Canada. I Personally, I wasn't afraid. I feel like I got antibodies because I already got it and all that kind of stuff. But... This is what I need to do. And I have brothers and sisters in Canada who are vaccinated. I have brothers and sisters overseas, missionary friends that got vaccinated. Who am I to not get vaccinated for a kingdom cause when I have brothers and sisters who have sacrificed and forfeited their personal liberties for the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I have personal liberties being from South Dakota, but it's not about my liberty. Paul says, these things I do for the gospel's sake. So what am I willing to do for the gospel's sake that I do for other stuff? So I had a choice, you know. Am I just going to say, well, pff, I, I'm not going to let someone, you know, infringe on my rights? Yeah. I, I, I looked at this as more important than my personal freedom. Yeah. And so I, I was willing. I was happy. I was glad to do it. Other than the fact I'm scared of needles. <laughs> yeah, and and I mean we certainly appreciate that. And and I know it is a controversial subject, but you know, one thing that some may not know is that you know, we were locked down for a long time up here and then as things have opened up, it's been it's been difficult to find people that were qualified, not from a ministry standpoint, but right. from restriction standpoints to come and be with us. So in some ways it's created a separation that 
it has been felt, I think, by a lot of Canadian brethren and, and, and by the churches up here. So, you know, I'm not trying to shoehorn anyone into this or that, but, but I think to rally around king, the kingdom and, and to do what we need to do, like you said, for the gospel, um, I think it's important. You know, I'll, I'll say this. And I, I shared this with my wife the other day. And um, I, I've been sincerely moved in my time here this weekend because a number of people have come up to me like very emotional in gratitude saying, thank you so much for being willing to do X, Y, Z to be here. Mm. It's because, sincere. Like they, they, I literally have, I, I've been a lot of places, but I feel like I have been more received here than most places I go to. Not That's not a slight on anybody, but there is a, this a sincere appreciation from the people here in New Brunswick recognizing that I did not have to do that to be this. I'm not patting myself on the back, but I am, I've been moved to be honest with you. Yeah. And I, I, I'm glad to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's been, it's been very rewarding to, to, to hear from people. Well, I, I feel like I, I am a broken record, but I've said it many times. I said it in the pulpit this morning. Uh, we are sincerely grateful that you're here. And it has literally been, as you know, two, two whole years this event two years ago that we've had somebody that we brought in from south of the border that's that's just been the reality because it's been so difficult so so thank thank you uh really thank you for commenting on that i think that's i think that's important um what one thing that i just want to probably a couple more topics and then we'll we'll wrap it up today but uh the first night when you preached you talked about how the two groups most affected over this pandemic have been young people um, and certainly that's why you're here. It's a youth weekend. So you've been, you, you ministered, you've been ministering to youth all weekend, but even on Friday, when the youth conference started, you were really ministering to ministry in that service. I mean, uh, I'm in ministry and you ministered to me that night, uh, sincerely. So if you would just unpack that a little bit and, and maybe, Speak on what you mean and, and why you feel that way. It's it's the young people and ministry that have both been most affected and maybe ways that, maybe comment mostly on ministry even now. Uh, how can we find some healing and move beyond the the carnage of the past two years? Yeah. Uh, again, the um, uniqueness that I have at the table is that I've lived life as normal the past two, three years, unlike rest of society because we we've had church as normal we've spit on each other laid hands on each other <laughs> like it just it hasn't stopped yeah um and so there was a segment where i was grounded and i did not travel because everybody else was shut down from the domino effect but when re-entry began to happen and i travel places i go to places that i've been to before and i felt like i was walking into a different church though it was the same church looking at different people though they were the same people and i seen the effect of of these um, prolonged cautions um, and and nothing's wrong with caution and care and you know to try to do your best you can but caution is not the same as faith they're different mm. and when you live in a season of extended caution you are now conditioning yourself in a contrary manner to faith and so uh, I man I, I could go a couple routes here but the so when I went back I remember one, one event I went to, I was um, praying and it was everybody had to stay in their bubble in the congregation and I wasn't supposed to pray for anyone. We weren't supposed to have an altar call other than you have altar where you're at, yada, yada. I get it. I And I didn't fight it. I didn't, I, I was compliant. And I went down to the side and there was this little uh, like squirt bottle uh, sanitation station. So I, you know, do that and I'm rubbing it. I'm waiting for it to dissipate, but it's like, getting slipperier and slipperier. I'm like, what in the, and I look at, it was anointing oil. It was, it was not a sanitizer squirter. It was an, I've never seen someone that had squirt stations of anointing. And so my hands are soaked with anointing oil and I'm like, what? And so I like, I'm looking for an escape route to go wash my hands. So I go out the door 
I find a bathroom and I'm trying to not touch any handles because like my hands are sopping wet with anointing. It sounds <laughs> self-righteous. <laughs> anyway, so I, I go to the bathroom and I go to wash it off. And God says, what are you afraid to lay hands and anoint people? And I pulled my hands away from that faucet. And I knew what I had to do. I mean, it was, it was real. I went back into the sanctuary with my soaking wet anointed hands. And I grabbed the microphone. It's like, <laughs> like a fish. <laughs> you know? And so I, I, I grabbed the mic. And I just shared with the people that I share. I go, I know this is so controversial. But I'm going to share what God just spoke to me. And if you are struggling with fear right now, I want you to come forward. I'm going to lay my hands on you. And the anointing of God is going to heal you. And I mean, everybody broke out of their bubble, came forward, anointed. I, I probably go to jail or whatever for whatever happened. But again, the voice of God is what you got to follow. And it been the anointing, a move of the Holy Ghost. So all that, to, I, I'm, I'm, I guess the scenic route to your what you're saying yep. is I've watched fear on faces and hesitation, reluctance. And the reason why I believe that the youth and the ministry have been affected greater than anyone else during this pandemic is because youth have lived from event to event. When the pandemic happened, all events was taken from them. And so they lost that. And they were exposed to their vulnerabilities, which is lack of consecration, lack of daily prayer life, lack of daily Bible reading. And I've watched basically youth groups talking to people across this movement. The youth group has like dissolved, diminished people, pregnant people, suicidal people, committing suicide, depression, all this stuff. It's horrible. Yeah. And then youth workers. You, I could not imagine being a youth president in this era. I know of a youth president that got in. He's super excited, but... Once he got in, COVID happened, and he was basically a one-term youth president, from my understanding of what I've been explained, simply because he could not take the anxiety of all of it, and basically, what do you have to show for it? Yeah. And they pulled away. I, I could not fathom. So I, ministry... I, I was going to say, I, I kind of jokingly say I've been the pandemic president, because like everything is upside down, topsy-turvy. Uh, it's just, it has been difficult. And sometimes, I think the, the biggest stress is that you try to implement things, make plans, take initiative, and then the rug gets just ripped out from under you at sometimes like the, the week of, or the last minute. And it's, it has been, it can be, it has been demoralizing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I mean, I give you honor for keeping your hat in the ring going after that's, I could not imagine. Okay. And so that segment, the youth, but ministry, when we're used to touching the lives of people, being involved, active, then you're preaching to empty buildings. You know, what I've watched is ministers be depleted, discouraged, because we're working more than we've ever did before, preaching multiple sermons, multiple services, et cetera. And what I've, what I've learned in observation is when you preach, we don't preach for response. We don't lead worship for response. But when, the, when we are doing that, we're pouring out virtue. And when people do respond, virtue comes back to us. It's cyclical. Yeah. And so when you're preaching to an empty building in a socially distanced building in a no altar service building, you're pouring out, but nothing's pouring back in. And you get to that place, you got nothing left to pour out and you are just weary and well doing. And so I could tell you story after story of ministers that have quit or are on the verge of quitting, suicidal. People that have talked to me, one pastor, I shared this the other night, that he a large congregation, I can name it, everyone would recognize it. And he he was riding his bike and he just overwhelmed with all the mandates and restrictions and trying to navigate through this. And you can't make everybody happy, you know, you're either pro, you know, mandate, anti-mandate, pro mass, anti-mass, let's gather, let's not gather. Like you can't make everybody everybody's against you no matter what. Right. And you're trying to lead a what was a unified group. And so he he basically was all this going through my, I couldn't sleep. And he just started pedaling faster and faster and faster. And he got as fast as he could. And he said, God, I just want my heart to explode. I want to die now. And he pedaled as fast as he could, hoping to have a heart attack. And, uh, I thank God, you know, a word came that day, that altar and God, you know, he shared that with me because he needed that healing word that night. And that's where we're at right now. It's, it's frustrating. And I, I wish I could say this is all done. It keeps looking like we see light at the end of the, end of the tunnel. But I'm telling you, there is a storm that is coming that is greater than these past two years. And it may not be the COVID and mandates, but I'm just telling you, there is a storm that is coming. And we need to get ministry and youth 
strengthened again. The Bible says if you're strength, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And I shared this yep. formula that night on uh, I think Friday night, Friday night we go yeah. anointed. Is this the Bible says in His pres- uh, God inhabits the praise of His people? Psalm twenty two three. Then it says Psalm sixteen eleven. In His presence is fullness of joy. Uh, and then it says in Nehemiah eight ten, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The key to these three things is. If we're weak, it's not God insulting you. You just need to come to that realization. I I am weak. Though I am anointed, I am weak. And you need to get God's presence. God's presence is found in praise. And the reason why we need his presence is because in his presence is fullness of joy. Why do we need his joy? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so the missing element that has affected us by not congregating together, you know, for an extended amount of time is praise has turned into an event. We praise on Sunday. We pray, we might praise on a Wednesday. And <laughs> and so like praise is the joy that we get in a service that becomes the, the, the joy of the Lord being our strength. Right. And people have been scratching their head like, man, I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible, but like, why do I feel like so weak and weary and tired? Praise has been the missing link. Mm -hmm. And praise should not be an event. Praise should be a daily lifestyle. Every day when you pray, have a moment where you lift your hands, lift your voice, worship God with intensity, and God inhabits the praises of your people in his presence, fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And so I I really want to encourage ministers and young people to praise God vibrantly, daily. Don't make praise an event. And um, there's more to it and all that, but I don't know. Maybe no, know. I think I think that that's that's absolutely powerful um, because it is true. I think you made the statement um, when praise is an event, eventually you will falter, fall. I can't remember the word you use, but yeah. um, so I, I think that has been a missing link, um, and it, it has been. It, it's a real tangible thing. I, I I can say, you know, by the grace of God, many things have maintained. Um, and it feels like things on the other, on the other side, if we can even say that, you know, we're starting to see good things happen and, and harvest and, and souls being added and all that. But yeah, it's, it's taken a toll. So yeah. thank you for sharing. Um, what I want to just ask you about your wife, Jordan, um, you know, you've, you've commented, uh, uh, the one thing that stands out the most is how God spoke to you one time that she's been a covering for you. And if it would not be, would not have been for her covering, you'd be in hell. Um, you know, you said, I think somewhat facetiously, but also seriously on the first night that if we were truly, uh, spiritual, that we would have invited her because she's a powerful minister. Um, I, you know, I wonder if you would comment. I think one thing that keeps resurfacing, um, maybe you could say in our fellowship or just in our era is, this may be longing for, uh, for ladies to find their place in ministry. And it sounds like I've never met your wife, but it sounds like she's really found her place in a niche, uh, in ministry. Um, maybe you, maybe you need to clarify my understanding of that, but just comment on that because I think, um, there are some ladies that, that sometimes don't know where to look or who to look to or, or how to find their place. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or comments on, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's, we talk hours about this subject. Certainly. Um, my wife is, she's powerful. She's incredible. And um, she would never push herself, present herself. Um, you know, she's very meek, very quiet, um, very introvert, happy to hang out in the shadows, never talk, see anybody. Um, but when she is visible, when she is heard, she is powerful. Now, when she preaches, when she ministers, she's not like the sweaty armpit woman, you know, preacher. <laughs> um, and, you know, if that's who you are as a lady, then God bless you. But, you know, my wife doesn't do that. She pretty much teaches. She talks. Um, but, man, there is an authority that takes place, and there's uh, a confirming of God's word that takes place. And um, she, I mean, I, I mentioned this this morning to the congregation. Uh, your father was teaching a session on ladies hair and that's the session god spoke to me and said if it was not for your wife's covering you'd be in hell and it's i i've been in low points and i i could cry very easily right now because i i got spiritual ptsd of the process of what we've been through and basically almost walking away from everything walking away from my marriage and my wife fought for me Uh, she embodies a christian woman 
um, praying, Father, forgive him, for he knows not what he's doing. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was so depressed. I was so lost. And so uh, if I could encourage men that are married, that you need to stop treating your wife as an accessory and see her as an ally in ministry. And far too often, like, we don't do this on purpose or intentionally, but we we kind of treat ladies as if, like, there's just these purse-shopping ditzes, you know, that really have nothing to offer other than, hey, you watch my kids. This this irks me and really, really bothers me when I go to events. And um, when I see all the guys, like, really just having fun, while watching all the ladies work, that 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 really bothers me, um, because I see the stress on their face as they're carrying the children, as they're making the food, as they're running to the store getting stuff, and the entire time the guys just drove around the golf cart making jokes, and um, I know I sound like a jerk and whatever, that's fine, but our ladies work hard, mm. and they are covering a, us with so much grace. Because the amount of guys that are struggling in their marriage, struggling in their spirituality, struggling with pornography, and that wife is basically propping them up. Mm. I've, I'm telling I countless times I've watched it and seen it. And we're doing ministry wrong when we do ministry compartmentalized from our marriage, from our spouse. And I believe there's way more women ministers that would rise if men would cooperate in the marriage and they would be a actual spiritual leader, not just a mouthpiece and just the face of the marriage, but they would lead spiritually and have their wife alongside them spiritually, pray together, read the Bible together. Talk, I, some of the greatest conversations, my wife and I will talk scripture together. We'll talk biblical concepts. We talk vision together. We talk about what God's doing in South Dakota, what God's speaking to us. We do devotions in the morning together. Uh, if you're not doing that, I'm not saying you're evil, wicked, you're not going to go to heaven. I'm just saying you're. I don't believe you're operating at full potential that you could. Because if if one could put a thousand to flight, the Bible says two could put ten thousand to flight. Yeah. I want a ten thousand to flight marriage. Mm. I don't want to put a. Th- it's, it sounds impressive to put a thousand to flight, but if you get your spouse involved and you're equally yoked, you put ten thousand to flight. So help help someone like me help help uh you know somebody that maybe is involved in ministry what are ways that you you mentioned conversation i think that's probably a significant part of it but how do you include and involve better what are some things that you did as a youth president as a pastor as a, now as a district superintendent um how has that evolved for you guys where she is involved to the way that she is yeah, one i mean I, I it's one of those war drums i beat at the church that I used to pastor, it sounds funny to say that, <laughs> um, about men stepping up. Um, because I, I really do believe we need more men stepping up. And for those that are like anti-women ministry and say, well, you know, anyways, one, I started reading my Bible for myself and I realized it's there. Uh, two, um, people that will just say, well, a, a woman in ministry is only when a man doesn't step up. Well, that's where we're at. Mm. <laughs> and the other thing is we don't have enough ministry. So I believe all hands on deck. Yeah. We need everybody in this last hour. There's 7 billion people going to hell. We need everybody. Yeah. Um, so what to do, how to do it. Um, one, you know, start praying with your wife, start reading the Bible with your wife, start, you know, talking about kingdom concepts. Don't just have your little guy group where you talk kingdom things, include your wife uh, to help. Like for me, I come home every day and I, I, I help with the kids. And uh, in fact, I changed my plan as we're homeschooling out instead of just being the, the Dean of students where I come and discipline everybody, <laughs> you know, when I'm called to the office, um, I, I actually help with school. Mm. I help my wife. Um, and I know not everybody's work situation can accommodate that but there's something that can be adjusted to accommodate yeah I, i'll help clean i'll help do this i'll help i'll ask babe what can i do what can i do to help around the house what can i do because she's carrying a tremendous load and so i'm going to help carry that load mm-hmm. and so um i'm helping with the kids i, I come home for um everyday lunch i come home uh, everyday supper and i eat with my family i know not everyone's life's the same but with whatever you can, you need to put more into the family and do ministry as a family. I don't know if that's no, part of your question absolutely. or the whole question. No, absolutely. But that has helped 
alleviate much off of my wife. When I travel and minister, 90% of the time, one of the kids is with me. I, I, I rotate my kids on schedule because it, it does. It, we're unable to be able to travel. I fly all the time. I can't fly five people every time. Mm-hmm. So I rotate one of our three kids and they go with me because I want to help my wife and I want my children not to feel like they were, you know, robbed a, a father. And I, I don't want my wife to feel she's robbed a husband. So we rotate in travel and ministry and it's been a blessing for our kids. It's been a blessing for our family. It's been a blessing for our marriage. So those are just some simple ways. And then at an event, I'm I'm helping with the ladies. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll go in the kitchen and clean. I'll I'll sweep up. I'll do what I, I'll do what I can to help, mm. because I'm telling you, women are working harder than men right now in a lot of ways. Yeah. And um, I, and I, another controversial thing, I guess. Well, no, I I I agree. I agree with that. Um, you know, and certainly, I I think sometimes. Perhaps women and even men will will kind of appease some of the frustration of all that, and they'll say, well, what I'm doing with my family is ministry. What I'm doing in the home is ministry, and it is. Mm-hmm. It, it absolutely is, but but it shouldn't be compartmentalized. It should try to be more of a, of a whole approach where it's there's not a distinct separation um, between home and church and district function and all that. Um, I, I think that that's so powerful, and it, it's you know it needs to be addressed. It needs to be talked about. Um, I think the last thing, if if we have, I think we have just a couple more minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you for the time. Um, you know, you uh, it was a just briefly you kind of touched on it and you just kept moving. But um, one thing that I would like to uh, just we don't need to take a long time, but address the issue of pornography in our generation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you even mentioned it from the perspective, I, I think maybe even that in ministry, uh, it can be a struggle. Um, certainly in, in the younger generation and young men, and now, of course, even in, in gray, growing numbers in young ladies. And the reason that I bring it up is you've been very open over the past several years about your struggle with it in the past and how God brought deliverance and help and healing there. So uh, I, I just think because it's such a prevalent issue, we'd be remiss if not to at least address it for a moment yeah. and offer hope to somebody that is in the trenches of struggle right now, in particular with addiction to pornography. Yeah. Um, a couple of things, since we'll be brief, uh, if people want to hear some more long-term things, advice, uh, just the other day we taught on how to never fall. Um, so if they go to your all church website, if you're archiving that. Yeah, guess, we'll link know. it. Absolutely. So there's one two i don't know if i'm allowed to talk about other podcasts on a podcast of course but there is a podcast out there called crucial conversations that i was interviewed and it's a good hour of this topic me sharing my story so i would encourage people to go there to listen to something more extensively about it but it is prevalent it is not um a rare issue in our movement it is a frequent issue in just last week i had two people reach out to me two people reach out to me one a pastor who is a district official um who has been battling since he was in seventh grade and now he's in his mid-30s wow and so i i and i could keep going on yeah i keep going on i people reach out to me quite frequently about this um and that would be because i've been very open about it um and so we need to do something about this issue and and there's a num there's so many things we could talk about right now but if you have to get serious about it you have to get serious about it and for people that may not know my story i was exposed to pornography at a young age i pursued it differently meaning i did not uh engage in self-gratification um, I basically wanted to reenact what I saw by going out on conquest. I did not struggle with self gratification until I got married. When I got married, I th- so like when I was in the world, when I was backslidden, I just basically did what I wanted to do. But when I got in the church, I had all my my only answer is like, well, the only way to do it less is to get married. It's better to marry than to burn. So you know, mm-hmm. here we go. So I got married and everything was good. But then. Uh, I never dealt with the issue. I never dealt with my lust issue. And so I thought marriage was the answer, but marriage is not the answer to the lust issue. Though 
there is help yeah. <laughs> in the marriage. Sure. But ultimately, you still got to deal with the issue. And so when I was weak, when I was struggling, when I was depressed, when I was going through hell, the devil leveraged my weakness. And then lust came back in my face. But I, 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 I had enough uh, moral standards not to go out and have an affair. But the only alternative was pornography. For me and that's what i went to and that's when i began to get into self-gratification mm -hmm. so it, that's not the same story for everybody but that's how it happened with me and um and i'll i i i i remember the day and the look on my wife's face when she walked in on me watching pornography and um i'm i'm determined that will never ever happen again mm -hmm. and um and so you know, in that moment it wasn't fixed it wasn't corrected it was the most embarrassing humiliating dark moment in my life and it spiraled out of control and i went into a dark valley and literally that's when everything was coming to a everything was exploding everything was unraveling mm -hmm. and my marriage was over everything's gonna be over not because my wife wasn't trying but i was done like i'm the type of person that when something's wrong, I want to build walls and keep people out. And anything that would resemble my uh, what could have been, I want to remove it. That was my old behavior. And now at research, I, I cut off everybody. And um, I was in a dangerous place. And that's when my wife was fighting for my soul. And uh, she heard Satan audibly laughing at us. And uh, she fought for me, man. Um, anyways, the... Um, it, it's been a it's been a prog progression to get delivered and god began to show me incrementally what to do and that's when i get more into how to never fall that's one of the sure. insights to it and that interview and crucial conversations and so my journey with media has been progressional and god finally helped me to understand that media was the gateway drug to pornography and that it doesn't have to be porn to be porn and so I've made some very strong stances uh, in our life and our marriage to not be engaged in Hollywood at all, not to be engaged with media. And uh, I never look at my stances as superiority or holier than thou. My approach is always I'm weaker than thou, and this is what I need to do because my flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. And so the only way to overcome pornography, I mean, really, I mean, it sounds so elementary. There's the prayer, there's the Bible reading, you know, faithfulness to church. But the big thing is to change a diet, and that's where most people struggle. They never change their diet. You do have to be accountable. If you're not accountable to anybody, you're, you're not going to win this battle. You need to be accountable. So a vulnerable conversation at some point yes. with a pastor, with someone you trust. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you got to be vulnerable, transparent, accountable. You got to be praying daily. You got to be reading your Bible daily. Not like chintzy little brief thing. You, you, you need, your, your problem is deep. And so you need to deepen your consecration. And then the, um, the diet. And I believe there's, an addict has triggers. And so, uh, you know, there's things that could trigger your addictive behavior, and it doesn't need to take a pornographic image to do it. It could be watching a football game, and you see a cheerleader with cleavage, and that triggers the appetite. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn that. And so that's why, like, I, I, I don't watch sports. I don't watch TV. I don't watch shows. Um, I, I don't watch superhero movies. I don't do any of that stuff uh, because it's not healthy for me to watch Jessica Alba and tights. Mm. I mean, it's not good for me. She, she's not naked, but it, it's doing something to my mind. If, if you are honest with yourself, you'll come to that conclusion. Yeah. Like, it, this ain't good for my eyes. There's a reason why they didn't pick Whoopi Goldberg to be Miss Fantastic. There's a reason. And Hollywood ain't stupid. Yeah. And so let's not be stupid and so like I, I i stopped trying to justify my my diet yeah and i got serious about my diet because i'm telling you the first thought in my day every every day the first thought of my mind was something sexual mm. and the last thought of my mind when i would go to bed was something sexual and i i thought i could never get out of it but i i promise you i could look you dead in the eye in all sincerity that is not the first thought on my mind and it's not the last thought on my mind in fact i rarely have those thoughts because i changed my diet i'm still a man i still can be tempted i'm not self-righteous holier than but i i have to be strategic and intentional about my discipline so i could live sober-minded because i right. don't want to lose my marriage and i don't want to lose out my walk with god absolutely 
thank you, man, for, for that, for everything today. It's been, I think, really good. And we've covered a wide range of yeah. topics. And uh, just, I guess, bottom line, we're very thankful that you've been with us. Thankful for your time today. And I know that what we've talked about will be a blessing to so many. So, thank you. Thank God you so bless much. you all. God thank bless. You. Thanks. Thanks again for tuning in to The Conversation. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to rate and review this podcast, share this episode with a friend, and subscribe for future content. This podcast is produced by Capital Community Church in Fredericton, New Brunswick. If you're in the area, we would love to have you for one of our weekly services. For service times and more information, please check out capitalcommunity.ca. We look forward to seeing you again next month on The Conversation.